So I'd like to get back for a second to the what to vec uh, thing that you showed. Uh, so you said that the words are associated to vectors uh, and that uh, we can associate some semantic value to this vector. Now my question is, I assume if we can do this, uh, this means it, ha it has been trained on a very big corpus. Uh, so first question, uh, am I assuming right? And second question, um, if so, so wha what does the vector actually represent? So what, how big is it and what are the components of it? So people have, so yes, this is generally trained on very large corpus or corpora, um, you know, typically a, a billion words or something. The thing is that there is a ridiculous amount of text that's available that you can use to train things like this. You can use all of Wikipedia, you can use, you know, the Gutenberg project, you can use just about any, uh, you know, dialogue on Reddit or whatever. So, you know, where you get, you know, uh, abbreviation and swearing and, uh, you know, badly spelled words, but so, uh, people have tried all kinds of different uh, data sources for this. Um, the dimension of the vector is anywhere between 50 and 5,000, depending on your application. Typically, it's about 1,000. Um, and uh, uh, there's uh, different kinds of experimentations along those directions where people don't... Um, uh, so basically, the first layer the is of, of uh, kind of a word to vec system is uh, a lookup table that associates every word in the dictionary with a vector. You can think of it as also a matrix by which you multiply a very sparse vector that represents the word, where all the components are zero and there's one one at the location of the word. So this vector is, is the size of the dictionary, you know, typically 100,000 or something, mm, even more than that. And then you multiply this by this uh, matrix of, of, of vectors and that's, you know, conceptually it's just like a linear layer in a neural net, but in fact it's implemented as a lookup table. Um, uh, so people now have been, think have been uh, experimenting with um, character-based uh, systems that, that look at individual characters instead of whole words. Uh, some, some of them actually are convolutional nets. So there is an interesting paper coming out of um, um, Google, uh, a team at, at Google Brain, uh, and I guess a couple of people from DeepMind. The first author is Oriol Vignals, uh, that trains language models to predict what the next word is going to be. So it's kind of a word to vec like thing, but they are first layer. The, thin the thing that seems to work well is system that's based on characters. So the input are not words, but characters. And then the first three layers are convolutional. And then there is a kind of a recurrent net, LSTM, like recurrent net to predict the next word. And that seems to be the best combination. And they, they get uh, astonishingly low um, uh, prediction errors or what's called uh, uh, perplexity in the, in the language model. It's pretty impressive. Thank you for your presentation. Um, just if you have some word, because we in robotics we usually have uh, uh, prob problems on learning, the problem of learning from multimodal data. Uh, so if you uh, can have some words on this, because I think it's uh, it's important for us. <laughs> right. Thank you. So this used to be a problem in sort of classical approaches to pattern recognition and AI. You know how you combine multiple streams. I mean here you just build a neural net with you know different channels for the input and you just train it. I mean it just doesn't make any difference. Right. So, I mean, you have to have a way of uh, basically dealing with missing data. If uh, if you can if you can hear a person, you d you can see that person, or vice versa. Uh, and and in fact, there is a technique that's used to regularize neural nets that called dropout, which actually is kind of like that. So you um, you train the network, but randomly you um, do as if half of the units in any particular layer did not exist. And you train the system to be robust to the absence of information from half of those units. And it actually has a regularization effect, which means the system generalizes better. So you can do the same thing. You can drop out parts of the input to make the system robust to situations where it doesn't observe that part of the input. Um, another thing you can do is have predictive models that actually predict what the audio should look like, should sound like, when you only see the, visu the, the visual input or vice versa. That that would be a, a form of predictive model that I talked about that, that you could yeah, you could do. Uh, in fact, that would explain perhaps the McGurk effect, right? Where uh, so the McGurk effect, if you guys haven't seen, you know, Google this on YouTube or whatever, and watch the videos, and um, um, you you perceive the sound differently depending on the shape of the mouth. Uh, so you can't you can't tell the difference between uh, between ga and ba 
just by the sound. It, um, you have to see the, 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 the mouth. And so if you have the sound for ga, but the person, uh, the video is for ba, then you perceive ba. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so thank you again uh, for your presentation. So I would, li I would like to come back to your uh, bedroom generation. You gave single images of bedrooms and you know the information that there will be a bed, there will be a window, there will be a sofa, etc. But when you generate an image, how uh, the perception of the uh, places of the objects are generated, how the algorithm knows th that the window will be placed uh, in front of the bed or uh, the near the bed and why the bed is not blurred because Actually, it, it could be anywhere in the bedroom. Yeah, that's right. It could be anywhere in the bedroom. So, uh, I mean, the way this is trained, uh, I mean, basically, conceptually, it's very much like uh, one of the slides I showed with a, with a manifold. Um, let me go back to that if I can find it. Right. Um, so the, the, the network that generates the bedroom is a function of this type. It's a neural net. It's, it's in fact uh, what's called a, a deconvolutional net. So it's like a convolutional net except all the arrows have been reversed so that the input is just a bunch of numbers and then the output is the, is the image. Okay? So it's like you know, normally convolutional net, you put an image in and you get kind of numbers out if you want for a classification. You can reverse it. Um, and, and so it's a function of this type. There is no X, there's no observed input. Uh, what y the only input are a bunch of random numbers, and they are sampled uniformly or with a Gaussian distribution um, independently, each of those. And then, um, uh, and, then, and then the system generates an image, and the adversarial network tells it how well, how far away from this uh, manifold it is, and then the system adjusts its parameters to kind of go on the manifold. And so what happens is that what you get is a, pr a linear parameterization you know, whatever point that you sample in this square, in this case, I mean, of course, it's a high dimensional uh, um, uh, space, but, you know, whatever uh, thing, you know, vector you sample, you, you, you generate randomly here is going to map to an image that to the discriminator is going to look like a bedroom and therefore is going to look like a bedroom. And so uh, some of those directions here parameterize things like, you know, how build, you know, where the bed is and what color it is and, and you know, how... Um, told it is, whether there's a window or not, where the window is, what the lighting is. So all the parameters that determine the, the shape of the scene, you know, are in this uh, b bunch of random, random vectors. But they, there's no meaning to them in the sense that it's not entirely clear how you would determine, like, how do you move the bed independently of the rest. It's just a result of, you know, generating, um, you know, training the system on all the data set, the data set you have. So it's a question that's related to um, the previous question and uh, uh, somewhat related to the previous question on multimodal uh, uh, processing. Um, so, so in the part on natural language understanding, uh, you mentioned predicting what next words are going to come up and translation. However, if you're thinking of a robot, what you want to do is use the language for interaction. Um, so telling a robot something and have it take that into account in its behavior. Um, and I think you're pointing at a solution to that when you talk about uh, learn teaching algorithms from, from examples. Um, and I wonder if that's been done, and if not, what might be missing in order okay. to really get that? Right. It's, it's a very active topic of research to build dialogue systems that basically understand when someone talks to them and then can respond. Uh, they it's not a solved problem in any, in any sense of the world, the, the word. I mean, there are dialogue systems that are trained by basically observing dialogues between people on Reddit or whatever, or, and, and, and then just you know, emulating that. Uh, so you know, predict what, uh, you know, what the next word is going to be by just uh, you know, training on, on dialogues on, uh, on you know, public, <coughs> public forums. Um, and sometimes that's entertaining. So for example, Microsoft deployed a chatbot that basically talks with people in China, no, I'm not talking about Thai. I'm talking about a Chinese chatbot, which is a big success. Um, you know, sort of lonely uh, men in China, uh, you know, kind of, you know, have sort of emotional discussions with a chatbot. Uh, it's called uh, 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 Chao Eyes, I think. Um, and then they try to develop, a, you know, kind of deploy a similar system in the in the in in the U.S. or in the West, in English, called Thai.ai. And as you many of you probably know, that was a complete disaster because it was trolled. 
and within 24 hours started talking like it was Nazi or something, and <laughs> or racist. And you know, of course, the machine was neither racist nor Nazi, but it was kind of trolled by by people who kind of tried to to uh, you know make it uh, produce uh, offensive things. And so, it's big, very big kind of cultural difference between you know China and the West in that in that respect, um, and it can go very wrong. Um, but you know, the actually conducting a dialogue to uh, to to do a particular purpose uh, using purely learning techniques, nobody knows how to do this yet. It's a completely unsolved problem. Uh, we can, of course, train systems to have dialogues for a particular purpose, but it's generally scripted. So you know, your typical uh, Now or Pepper or your typical Siri, Cortana, Google Now, etc. A lot of the interactions that are possible are scripted by by humans. Um, so the you know having a, a system that can just learn uh, uh, dialogue you know with a purpose like this is uh, very challenging. There's a pro there's a project at Facebook to do this called Project M, where we have people use uh, essentially human operators to kind of solve problems through Messenger, and we have AI systems looking over the shoulder of the human operator and try to see if they can emulate them. Turns out it's very difficult to do if the you know if the um, the, the the set of topics is completely open. Um, but it's uh, probably not entirely impossible if the topics are kind of limited. So if it thinks like, you know, talking about movies or restaurants uh, or things of that type. And, and uh, some of you may have heard that uh, Facebook uh, just yesterday announced uh, kind of a platform for de developing chatbots essentially for particular purposes within Messenger. Uh, thanks for your talk. And uh, I was wondering if I understood uh, in uh, many of the systems you presented, you have uh, an offline training, then you use it online. But uh, how do you decide when the world has uh, enough changed and it makes uh, too much mistakes to make a uh, relearning and uh, to being able to reuse it? Okay, so some, some systems are trained offline and then used for a while, and then when we get more data, we just retrain them. But some of them are just trained online. So uh, when you want to represent, for example, the the, the tastes uh, of a user, uh, so for example, uh, you know these sort of machine learning systems that are used to determine what to show you on Facebook every day. So when you connect to Facebook uh, every day, Facebook could show you roughly 2,000 or 3,000 items, um, but nobody has time for that. So the Facebook systems try to select 100 or 150 items from your friends or other sources to show you. And those are meant to be things you are supposed to be interested in. So for example, I don't know, you like sailing. We're going to show you pictures of sailboats from your friends. Uh, but you like, you hate cat pictures. We're not going to show you cat pictures, right? Uh, maybe you like cat pictures. I don't particularly like cat pictures. Um, so, you know, the Facebook systems are going to learn this, you know, by how much, you know, how you interact uh, with, with your friends and with particular content in your friend. And that's done on the fly. So though you're the model of what you like is updated on the, t on the fly. Uh, and there's more and more deep learning systems that are used in all of those systems for information ranking and, and filtering. Uh, for Facebook, you have the like buttons, etc., cetera, uh, as a supervision uh, signal. But uh, for the, um, the road analysis, for example, if uh, we're in a car and uh, we gave the car to somebody uh, who's not uh, uh, robotician or information. Uh, how could it uh, could it know that there is a mistake on the person, or for example, the sand uh, on the ground, etc.? Right. So let me actually show you a video related to this. So this is a, a video that shows this little robotics project that I showed you, the that I talked to you, told you about. Um, so uh, let's see. So this robot, uh, this is built in 2005. It has uh, four uh, cameras, two stereo pairs. It's got three computers in the belly, but they are, I mean, four, but really three. And here it's dri driving itself using stereo vision. So there's no learning. It just does stereo, and it figures out if something sticks out of the ground from 3D recon reconstruction. Um, and stereo only works up to about 10 meters. Uh, in fact, here it's been crippled. But um, and now we turn on the neural net. The neural net can do long-term, long-range vision, and it sees the wall from the start, and it knows it has to go behind it, but it sees it from the start, so it kind of drives around. Uh, and you'll see it drive around the row of people here, the same way. Um, uh, you know, it sees that from from the start. This uh, neural net. Uh, there is a phase of training of this neural net. Uh, it's a convolutional net. It's trained 
uh, in the lab, okay, on, on recorded data. Um, but the, um, the, the labels have actually been obtained through stereo vision. So uh, there's no human labeling of whether a pixel is, is, is traversable or not. It's been collected by just running the robot and then collecting data and then stereo figures out if it sticks out of the ground or not. Um, and while the robot uh, runs, uh, it uh, you know it sees an object from far away. It it, it maybe it doesn't know if it's an obstacle or not. But as it, as it gets closer, it gets a label from stereo that tells it uh, this is actually an obstacle because it sticks out of the ground. And so it includes this in its uh, list of training samples, and it on the fly adapts its last its last couple layers to actually classify that correctly. So for example, it's been trained in forests and and uh, and you know path pathways and stuff like that. And it gets in a field and it doesn't know if it can you know, drive, uh, you know, where it can drive, and uh, it can adapt this very quickly. It's sort of like, you know, if you had, uh, you know, Pepper has, has uh, you know, laser distance uh, and ultrasound rangefinders and bumpers, and so, uh, you know, it can use its camera to look at something and then it gets to it, and if it bumps, if the bumpers uh, uh, hit or the ultrasound thing hits, uh, then it can figure out this was actually uh, an obstacle, so you can now retrain the top few layers of the convolutional nets if you could run one on a one of those platforms and uh, and do this adaptation automatically so y you can have self supervision if you want that actually works um, yeah this this uh, this robot actually uh, works pretty well let me skip to uh, so here we uh, cripple the vision system so it's only stereo and only sees at two and a half meters this is to test the control system the control system is also trained actually um, there's some learning in it uh, so again, here it's it's blind. It's very uh, myopic. So this is Pierre Semanet. He now he was a student, PhD student at the time with me. Now he's um, actually works at Google. And this is Raya Hetzel, one of the inventors of Dr. Lim that I was mentioning earlier. She's now the director of the uh, robotics research group at DeepMind in London. Uh, and the first time these guys uh, jumped in front of the robot, um, I was like, "Are you sure you want to do this?" Um, and uh, you know they were pretty confident because they actually wrote the code for it. So they. Okay, I'm sure there's still many questions left, but we are unfortunately running out of time. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again for this really exciting presentation. Thanks for having me.